Chiron is a Canadian integrated medical cannabis company with its core operations in Colombia. Uh, Chiron combines leading international scientific expertise, agricultural advantages, and brand new product market entrance experience to address the unmet medical needs in a market of over 620 million people in Latin America. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Darren Collins, CFO of Chiron Life Sciences. That's perfect. Thanks for that, Phil. Um, and thank you for each of you for, uh, for attending our presentation here. I'm uh, also joined by two of my colleagues, Nicole Marchand, who uh, manages investor relations for us. She's from Brick Capital. I'm here with uh, my colleague, Matt Murphy. Um, Matt is uh, former chief of pharmaceutical investigations for the, for the DEA. So, you know, a person we're very proud to have as part of our team. Um, you know, really heads up our uh, compliance and, and security elements, which is something that you know people obviously ask about when we start talking about uh, cannabis in Colombia. So we'll talk to you about that a little bit more. Uh, my name is Darren Collins. I am uh, founding chief financial officer of the company. Uh, my business partners, the population in California, that's one city. Um, Bogota itself is approximately 10 million people. So we're, we're looking to address largest city centers within Latin America for the primary or most predominant indications. And that's, that's really core to our, our business model. Um, looking at Colombia as a country, a beautiful place. I have spent six of the last 22 months in Bogota, Colombia. Um, I have developed very good relationships with uh, business partners and people down there. It's just a wonderful country to do business and I'll do business there for the rest of my life. Um, you look at uh, the middle class has doubled over the last you know, 10 or so years. Investment grade rating from the major rating agencies, you know, great trade relations. Um, and, you know, frankly speaking, the best place in the world to grow cannabis at this point um, in, uh, in time. There's three reasons for that. One, you're right on the equator, so, you know, you have 12 hours of sunlight, 12 hours of darkness. You have to supplement the flowering cycle a little bit with an a bit of artificial light. Um, first factor. Second factor, you have a differential of elevation that enables you to grow at an altitude where you don't have significant humidity and mold issues. Um, the third is that Colombia has an excellent set of medical cannabis regulations um, that is really, you know, probably some of the best medical cannabis regulations in the world right now. You go around the equator line where you have that sun darkness profile, um, you evaluate each country based on those three, three criteria, and you will quickly come back to Colombia and say, yes, this is the best jurisdiction in the world to cultivate cannabis at this point in time. Um, the team that we've assembled is, you know, frankly, uh, one of the best, if not the best team I've ever had the pleasure to work with in my, my career. Um, Alvaro Torres is a Colombian U.S. citizen, um, has his bachelor's and master's from RPI University, MBA from the University of Georgetown, was a founder of SNC Lavalin in Colombia, built it from two people to 2,000 people over the course of about three years. Um, Chris Caprawa, um, you know, head of institutional sales at Macquarie Capital Markets in Canada, Head of institutional sales at Dundee Capital Markets in Canada, partner partner at Sprott, um, Sprott Capital Partners. Um, I've known him for about 15 years. He's just a fantastic capital markets institutional sales professional, and really has a lot of great institutional relationships that we've we've had investing in the company and buying in the market here as well. Um, myself, uh, corporate finance background, predominantly equity finance, M and A. Did a stint with a number of uh, firms in Canada, and then actually worked in the city of London for a mid-market investment bank there. Uh, became the King Vault, the cannabis business about four years ago. First company I was founding CFO is Namaste Technologies. That company went from $5 million post-money valuation on the initial capital raise to, to $1.2 billion in, in two years. Um, suffice it to say, did personally very well on that, very well for investors as well. Um, and then, you know, the uh, Opportune time uh, joined uh, joined Chiron as, as founding CFO and spent all my time on this company over the last uh, last two years. Andreas Malagri is a uh, former brand manager for Advil in Colombia, so rolling out of you know products market um, market penetration. Advil they took from zero to thirty percent market share over a number of years. Um, so this doctor engagement education, um, you know all these core commercial activities, he is absolutely fantastic. Um, Juan Diego wrote the regulations for medical cannabis in the country of Colombia. Um, this opportunity that we're all afforded today to invest in the Colombian um, and you know international cannabis space is all based on deregulation. If you don't understand regulation, you're walking in the dark without a flashlight. And, you know, Juan Diego is our flashlight. Um, Matt Murphy is here with me, former head of pharmaceutical investigations for the DEA, um, compliance, security, protocols. Um, you know, we couldn't be more happy to have Matt. 
Um, you know, really all our security staff that works for Matt has been sourced through the DEA. So, you know, we're going into the regions that we're doing business in, we're approaching the DEA and saying, hey, you know, who are the people that we need to be working with? And, and Matt's heading up that effort. Uh, Maria Fernanda is a McGill um, educated uh, medical doctor. Um, McGill is one of the leading Canadian universities that's been prescribing cannabis in Canada for the last four years through a number of clinics as well as doing clinical trials. Um, she is a Colombian national and actually engaged to, uh, to a gentleman, a Latin American gentleman, and moved back down to Latin America. So she was looking for an opportunity. We were fortunate enough to find her. And uh, the day after we announced her canopy, tried to steal her from us. So that's a pretty good validation in our mind of, of the quality of hire we made in her. And she'll manage all the doctor education um, that's really core to our business model and a competitive advantage of ours. The other individuals here um, manage uh, divisional activities. All very competent, capable, and, and qualified professionals. Our board, Cindy Himmel, Mark Monahan, both capital markets professionals, investment banking backgrounds, uh, lots of good relationships and expertise in the Canadian public markets. Alvaro Yanez is a Colombian lawyer, was formerly with Pacific Rubialis, which was a $7 billion Colombian oil and gas company. Peter Simeon is the top producing partner at the second largest law firm in Canada, so Canadian capital markets, corporate governance. Um, you know, couldn't have a better lawyer or partner than we do with Peter. And you will notice here Vicente Fox, the former president of Mexico, also on our board of directors. Uh, Vicente is one of the most interesting and dynamic people that I've had the pleasure to spend time with. Um, he started off as a bottle delivery boy in Mexico, worked himself up to CEO of Coca-Cola Mexico. When he started, it was a three to one Pepsi market. When he finished, it was a three to one Coke market. And to today, Mexicans consume more Coca-Cola products per capita than any other country in the world and Vicente did that. So, you know, to be able to sit down and ask him the question, how do you do that? Um, the answer is twofold. Um, one, diversity of product offering. Um, so you can get your Coke and vanilla, you can get it in cherry, you can get the big bottle, the small bottle, etc. And then brand, um, brand association and endorsement. It's exactly what we're doing here at Chiron. We couldn't be happier to, to have him on the board and uh, have his insight on, on things like that as well as frankly, access to his Rolodex. He's a very well-networked well, uh, very well -networked individual, to say the least. We just rolled out our cosmeceutical brands. Um, we actually initially imported the CBD from Switzerland um, to complete these formulations. We have Invima approvals on eight products, which Invima is the equivalent of the FDA in Colombia. This is how the products look here. It's a full suite of products for women. Um, everything from morning, night, day creams, body mists, etc. Um, we rolled that out actually last week in, uh, in Colombia at the largest wellness and beauty conference in the, in the country. We're coming right into the prime retail season, so you know, our timing couldn't be better on bringing this to market. Um, we have initial sales on it. The Colombian wellness and beauty market is very large and grows annually at a, you know, a very good rate. Um, suffice it to say that uh, you know, we're very pleased with the rollout of this product and see great potential for it. It's essentially 2% CBD by weight. Um, you know, claims that we're able to make through and beam on these products is, for instance, um, CBD is more hydrating than vitamin E, for instance. We can, we can say that. Our brand ambassador is uh, Catalina. Um, she is an uh, absolutely fantastic addition to, uh, to this product line. She is the host of Survivor in Colombia. She was a judge on Colombia's Next Top Model. She is also a soap opera star and very well known throughout the country. 100, 1.5 million um, Instagram and um, Twitter, YouTube followers um, on Quita at this point, which is the brand, we're about 170,000 social media followers. So it's really taken hold and you know going quite viral considering that we've, we've only launched this product last week. The medical cannabis products, we're gonna roll these out early in the new year, initially it'll be CBD, then it'll be uh, THC products. Um, initial distribution model will be specific formulations. That's by prescription of a doctor filled or formulated by a lab and delivered to the patient. And then we're gonna work on uh, getting Avima approvals for branded mass market products that'll sell through pharmacies. Sub 1% THC by weight over the counter, over 1% THC by prescription of a doctor filled through the pharmacy. Think of it like uh, Tylenol and Tylenol 3 uh, would be the best example to understand that distribution method. Um, core to our business model, the slides got switched up here. I'm gonna go with this one and then go back. Um, Columbia has inherent agricultural advantages in the production of cannabis, however, that is a comparative advantage to places like Canada and the United States and Europe where growth costs are much higher and capital costs are much higher. 
Um, if your competitive advantage is the same as everyone else in the market in which you operate, it's not a competitive advantage. It's a comparative advantage to other regions of the world. The competitive advantage in our mind is controlling the distribution networks. And ultimately, this is a product development and distribution company. We're fully integrated at this point in time. Um, down the road, it very well could be that we're sourcing our cannabis within the specifications that we require from external providers. Um, the cost is so low that even to do like a cost plus 20 on a, you know, an offtake of cannabis and process into our products is de minimis in terms of the overall market potential in terms of gross margin. Um, so really intuitively, patient association endorsements that we have three exclusively result in doctors in the network, result in patients in the network. And you know, if you think about it just practically, patients listen to their doctors and doctors listen to their patient associations. So the more that we can optimize these exclusive relationships, the more potential addressable network we develop, the more audience that we're going to have for our products as we roll them out. Um, so how do, we, how do we work with these patient associations and doctors as the key gatekeepers? Um, we bring in the top international experts from around the world to host them at conferences, to educate them, and to create e-learning platforms and educational materials um, to deliver to them, to you know, create mind share and create preference for the Chiron brand or product. Um, Riyab Lida, I spoke about Michael Gore is one of the leading authorities from Israel. Um, Daniel Schechter owns the largest medical cannabis clinic network and patient base in the province of Ontario. We got the first medical clinic license for the distribution of cannabis. Um, both Michael and um, Vincent work with Daniel, and Adam actually is my, uh, my brother, my stepbrother, who was hired over for it Ray. So all those you know, years of knowledge and experience were bringing the best of international expertise to Columbia to teach doctors there how to prescribe. Um, so that's the you know, frequency of dosage, amount of dosage, what are the products available, what is the difference between THC and CBD for something like chronic pain or epilepsy. And that is absolutely fundamental and defensible in our business strategy. This is the competitive advantage we have, is the you know, depth of you know, knowledge that we're delivering to doctors, the exclusive relationships, and ultimately securing and protecting those distribution networks. Um, coming back here, where are we going? We're also doing a series of clinics. The idea is not to populate the continent of Latin America with a storefront, uh, but the idea is to create not only distribution centers where patients can come in and get a prescription for medical cannabis and talk about their various conditions, but it's a center for education as well. So if you're a doctor and you're saying, hey, my patients keep coming in and asking me about medical cannabis, but I have no idea about this stuff, how to prescribe it, and I can't ethically do so until I know what I'm doing. A doctor can come into these centers, get a full informational package, sit down with, um, with a medical professional and have an open discussion about what cannabis is and what cannabis isn't. Cannabis is not a cure for cancer, but it certainly helps with things like nausea, sleep deprivation, um, et cetera, um, appetite loss. Um, so it's really competing, treating the symptoms of you know, the patients that overall improve their, their quality of life. Um, so you know, we, can, we can have those discussions in these centers, you know, clinical, medical, um, type setting, it's you know, not a bunch of people sitting around getting high, it's a bunch of people talking about you know, what medical cannabis is and what medical cannabis isn't. It also develops our brand. Um, you can think about it like an Apple store. Um, you go into an Apple store, you can you know, interact with the professionals from Apple, you can hold the product, you can see the product, you can you know, determine which product you want, and then maybe you go buy it online, and that's fine. But you know, again, it gives look, feel, and uh, you know, really develops the brand, and that's, that's core for us in our strategy. We announced our first acquisition. We're acquiring a series of pain clinics, neuropathic pain clinics. They're doing consultations and procedures. The idea being that this gives us an initial 100,000 patients, that we have you know, captive patients within our network. We're going to close on this here soon. It does 10 million of revenue, about 1.8 of EBITDA. Um, we're paying uh, $7 million in cash and stock for it, and a $5 million earnout based on patient conversion and insurability of the products. Um, you know, we get these, product insured, these products insured through this clinic a year or so out, and all of a sudden we're looking at you know, an annual spend of $1,500 a patient on 30,000 patients at a 30% conversion rate to medical cannabis from things like opioids. That's a business doing $45 million in revenue, and you know, I think the gross margin on something like that is going to be you know, at least 70%. The acquisition just paid for itself. So we like these acquisitions. We'll continue to do these all day long. And have the toolkit across, uh, across our executive team to to really execute and implement m and transactions. I've probably done you know, 15 to 20 of them over my career. Um, other members of our, our team have done similar, if not more. 
We are into Chile. We signed a uh, MOU. We will finalize that into a definitive agreement, which will make us a multi-jurisdictional company. Chile is a beautiful country. It's about 1.8 million patients represented within that market. Um, we have great partners there, and really what we're bringing to the table is the medical expertise and distribution expertise, where this will give us uh, security of supply of, of medical cannabis to be able to process into uh, medications for patients. So we are into Chile, um, you know, now multi-jurisdictional. Uh, just in terms of expansion, we see Mexico here coming up soon. You have to think of getting Vicente's on our board, we'll be front and center on that. We also like Argentina, Peru, um, Brazil is obviously a big crown jewel. We think you know, Brazil is going to take a little bit longer, Panama, uh, but those are really kind of the key markets that we like within Latin America. Here's the actual production uh, facilities. They're in Ibagué, Colombia. It's about three hours outside Bogota. Um, beautiful part of the country, never a history of, of any conflict. Uh, we're located next to two major military installations. We have about an installed capacity of 10 tons right now. Um, the total property um, capacity is probably in the neighborhood of about 170 tons. Those are long tons. So that's 170,000 kilos, 170 million grams. When you look at the potential economics on something like this, um, it's really quite impressive given you know, where our market cap is today. Um, you know, we are modeling a $4 gram equivalent selling price. It's an extracts only market. Um, we determine that on purchasing price parity per capita between Canada and Colombia, as well as the out of pocket spend on alternative medications, as well as what is available in the black and gray market in terms of selling price per milligram. Um, if you look at 170 million grams at you know, $4 gram equivalent on a B2C distribution model, um, you know, your 680 million capacity of revenue on those numbers, at that you know, scale, your 90% you know, plus gross margin, your capital expenditure to build that out is. Um, you know, this whole 17 hectares is approximately $30 million. You're looking at about 10 times that capital expenditure profile here in the United States or Canada. So, you know, these are some of the best numbers I've frankly ever seen in my career. But, you know, when you look at the numbers um, and you think, you know, okay, well, that's great. But, you know, our objective is not to be a bunch of cultivators and farmers. Our objective is to control the patients. So, tying this back to the patients, um, you know, you need about 1.3, call it over a million patients to be able to consume that much cannabis on an annual basis. The core objective of the company is not to be a cultivator of 2 million square feet. The core objective of the company is to have a million patients to consume all the cannabis that we are able to produce. Um, and that's, again, fundamental. When you look at the economics um, in terms of, you know, return potential on our market cap today, and if we build this out over the next, you know, call it four or five years, um, you know, you have a multi, multi-billion dollar company that's $110 million market cap right now. Now obviously, you know, that's not going to be a linear transition over that timeline. It's going to take a lot of work, it's going to take a lot of effort, it's going to take, you know, the right people doing the job. But, you know, I, I wholeheartedly believe that we can get there. We've could have sold this company multiple times over at this point, both uh, to, you know, many of the entrants within, uh, within the market. But, you know, if something's so great, why don't you ever want to sell it? We want to build it. And, you know, we're making great progress on that. Um, here's a little bit on our capital structure, again, about $110 million market cap Canadian. Um, you know, us as management own a lot of stock. Um, I think, uh, you know, generally investors appreciate that. I, myself, personally have invested in every financing this company has done, as well as bought stock in the market. Um, I'm all in, including options, RSU stock that I've purchased about 1.7 million shares. So, I've really always invested in this, and as do my business partners. We just didn't give ourselves a bunch of free shares and you know, ask people to pay for the same shares we got for free. We have our hard dollars in and you know, we're fully committed and escrowed on, on our stock as well. So we're taking a long-term uh, long view on, on building this business. You know, it'll be obviously near-term um, catalyst for investment appreciation, but you know, we see this as a great place to be um, and have exposure to over a long term. We have cash on the balance sheet. We have enough cash for you know, our near-term Requirements, we will have to raise money at um, some point for a growth company. I think that's just obvious, but we're not out financing right now. Really what we're focused on is, is cleaning up these, uh, these warrants. So there is some stock available in the market right now. Um, it's trading about a million and a half shares a day on average. Um, so at that price, it's, it's pretty good volume as well. And that's really why we're getting a bunch of institutions starting to look at, um, at our company as well, because that volume has been building, momentum has been building. And we're really kind of transitioning from, you know, kind of early round, high net worth, um, you know, more speculative investors, kind of more institutional type investors. Um, some market precedents, um, you know, I think this takes up quite well on average. These transactions are, you know, $245 million in comparison to our market cap of 110. 
So as we're kind of you know transitioning through these early round shares and you know really building the momentum, I'd like to see us start tracking towards this valuation. So I think you have a good market opportunity here on, on this level. Uh, Canaccord actually covered us. Uh, we can say that Canaccord's the leading investment bank in Canada at this point in time. Um, they have a three dollar and forty cent target on uh, the company. They started with three bucks. They bumped it up forty cents on on Chile when we went into Chile. So you know they're obviously seeing value here. Their blue sky target is seven dollars. So they give two target prices. They gave one is kind of a core base twelve month target of three forty, and they said uh, you know an upside. Um, target of seven dollars. Uh, so just to summarize, um, you know, we're targeting a very large unaddressed market. We're the leaders within that market. We're first to revenue within that market. We have uh, proven expertise in navigating the regulatory environment, uh, being first to license as well as entering other countries as well as being first to revenue. Um, we have um, you know a great clinic strategy that we're rolling out. Uh, we have good installed capacity to meet the needs of about 100,000 patients at this point in time. Um, you know, medical patients generate recurring revenues and high margins. This is a high margin recurring revenue business model that um, we think has a lot of longevity. And, you know, we have an attractive capital structure, fully diluted, we're under 100 million shares. We've preserved our capital structure quite well. You'll see a lot of cannabis companies um, with, you know, a half billion shares out or something like that, and it's, you know, just stock all over the place. Um, you know, we want to keep a nice tight capital structure that preserves um, preserves value for, for investors by not diluting down that capital structure too much. And we've been successful in doing that. Um, and you know, aside from that, our management team uh, you know has put a lot of hard dollars on the table. So we're we're aligned with investors, and, and we believe in this company. So uh, thank you again for uh, for hearing our presentation. Again, you know, trades on the uh, TSX Venture KHRN. Uh, OTC, KHRNF, Monday to Friday, 9.30 to 4, including national holidays. So if anyone has any questions, happy to answer them. Please. Uh, yeah, can you talk a little bit uh, more about the pain clinics? Uh, it's just two physical locations, 100,000 patients that we're seeing last year. Do they have exclusive doctor, prescribing doctors in those We places? have, great question, we have 46 doctors and clinicians that we pick up as part of the transaction. So uh, Maria Abuelita will uh, head up that educational process with them. And you know you can think of it really as developing a sales force for medical cannabis. Um, so those are you know our doctors that will go in with the educational materials, we'll hold seminars, training sessions, and you know, really teach these doctors about how to prescribe medical cannabis. They're very excited about it. Um, they've seen what a lot of these medications can do to people, um, opioid-based medications. Etc. Um, and they're very excited about an alternative to that. So I think I think we'll get good penetration. We have the right people doing the right work to really make that a successful acquisition. But do you think you guys are going to go raise capital like in the next 12 months? You're going to be sort of monitoring things pretty well. Well, you know, on the basis of the listing and uh, last financing, I mean, we can stretch our capital out for you know 12 or more months. Um, but you know that's not going to accelerate the business plan as, as quickly as you know, we like. Um, you know we start getting into other jurisdictions and really scaling the business. Yeah, you know if the opportunities are right, we will take additional capital within the next 12 months. That being said, our preference is on the next financing that this company do, does is to bring a strategic investor, a um, large Latin American pharmaceutical company, perhaps a large LP, and you know get a premium for that subscription. Um, as well as uh, you know, potentially some form of off-date agreement as well. So we, we prefer to do something on a strategic basis, basis with one large party that you know validates the company um, more than we already have, and as well provides good technical expertise as well to you know help build out our product portfolio. So there's there's good companies out there. Um, you know that's really where I'd like to see our next source of capital come from. And I think that's in the interest of all investors. And, you know, again, um, we're investors as well, so we like to evaluate transactions. We've collectively, as a management team and board, done, done a lot of those over our careers. So. If anyone uh, has anything else?